like to welcome everyone today. If you're a guest today, we are so glad to have you in service with us. If you're joining us online today, wherever you're watching from, we welcome you as a part of this service today as well. Praise God. And uh, we welcome uh, the Pasadena ministry, Sunday morning ministry. They were informed suddenly <laughs> this week that their facility was being closed down for some period of time. Um, so they are with us today and perhaps for the foreseeable future we regret their circumstances but we appreciate having them with us today this is a this is a great great group of people for years the focus of the the ministry there was children and a couple of years ago they expanded uh, to an adult service as well um, but th they have the the group there has been one of the model ministries at Antioch. Their love, commitment, dedication for, I don't know how many years, 10 years, wow, 10 years, uh, this group has given of themselves, and uh, only, only heaven knows. Sister Angie Millette, who is now our Sunday School Coordinator here at Arnold, as well as for Antioch Central, was there for years. And uh, only, only God knows the investment of time and money. It's, it's kind of a standing policy uh, for ministries that if you purchase supplies, you purchase things, you can, you can get reimbursed by the church. And uh, the, the, the people in this ministry have consistently, consistently given of their personal finances and asked nothing in return. There's nothing wrong if you ask for a reimbursement. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think it's amazing also to see their investment. And I believe God has blessed these folks, but I believe He will continue to bless them for their investment. So again, we welcome you, but as a senior elder of Antioch Central, I take advantage of this moment to honor you today. Brother Kimbrell, I think he's down somewhere dealing with stuff for uh, but to the rest, those of you that are here that are normally a part of Pasadena, would you just lift your hand? Look around you, see those that are... Praise God. Amen. I'd like to read one verse to you this morning as we begin today. I, uh, I feel like, if you will bear with me, this will be a twofold message First off, a challenge, particularly to the men, fathers, but also to the men in general. But then I also feel like it will be a word of encouragement to everyone that would receive it. This is also one of those messages where uh, you know as, a, as the preacher that you are having to preach something that you don't have down that you don't have it all worked out and you are not succeeding perhaps at the way you should. I don't think that part, in my opinion, I don't think that part is hypocrisy. The hypocrisy is not having it and pretending you do. I don't think the honesty and acknowledgement that you don't have it is, is the hypocritical part. So I acknowledge to you I am not especially with the first part today. I am not preaching as the expert and uh, the one that has achieved all of this. Uh, this may sound odd, but really there's a lot of times as a preacher you feel like you're kind of preaching to yourself. I don't know if that's like, you know, a mental issue because you're talking to yourself. Or, um, so I, I just want to state that. I, I, 
I just want to state that because I, again, I, am, I do not perceive myself to be an expert. So one verse, and we will go from there, and it's found in Genesis chapter 2, and it's verse number 15. The Bible simply says, The Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden, and he gave him the responsibility of doing two things. To dress it and to keep it. He placed him in the garden to dress it and to keep it. Preached to you this morning for a little bit on this subject, gardeners and guardians. Gardeners and guardians. Father, I thank you for your presence. I know, I believe that your presence has been manifested here all morning. I believe that you have already done very significant things in some lives that are in this place today. And I thank you for that. But I also trust and believe that you are not finished in this service and that through your word, your spirit will minister. God, I pray again this morning that this would not be a sermon to simply take up time in this service, but that it would be a message that would come from you to speak to the hearts of the hearer today. I trust you this morning. I depend on you. Trust you for your anointing today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I have mentioned you several times over the last several several weeks particularly a couple of weeks ago preaching from the book of Ecclesiastes and some of the things that Solomon had said there is a verse in the book of Ecclesiastes that I feel like more and more I understand that verse and that verse says there is nothing new under the sun. I think too often we convince ourselves that we have it so bad in 2017, especially from the perspective of trying to be Bible-believing pre- uh, people, trying to be uh, allow God to govern, lead our lives, and that we have it so hard today and we're facing challenges that make it so difficult, but there is nothing new. We, we blame a lot of the conditions in our world today on various issues that are going on in our world today, and we basically make them the excuse for certain behavior, certain actions. The Godwin touched on it Thursday night, but we deal with all kinds of temptation and challenges of all kinds of temptation, and now in a way in which really no generation like this generation has ever had to face before. The, the, at simply the touch of a finger, you have access to all kinds of ungodly things. You don't have to go to a store to buy a magazine anymore. You can simply make a few taps on a device and have access to anything you want to have access to. And we oftentimes feel like that, you know, a little bit of a little bit of stumbling and falling is acceptable because we are bombarded with so much temptation and surely God understands the challenge that we face. And yet in a garden with one thing that God said, have everything you want, but this you can't have. Man, I say that generically, mankind could not overcome one temptation. So there is nothing new under the sun. There is a need today. Brother Godwin in his message last night to our youth in the Chosen United service, and it was a great service. There was 
such a powerful move of God. The message that he preached last night was you could just feel God talking and ministering, and the response was phenomenal, and he was rather plain with a few things last night to get his points across, nothing inappropriate or out of order, but he just spoke the truth. And one of the things he said last night was it takes 15 seconds to become a dad. But really, being a father, it's a whole different thing. It's a whole different thing to be a father. We've got a challenge in our world today because we've got a lack of fathers. Not dads, but fathers. But actually, it's really not anything new. I may, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll try to you know, get revved up here this morning, all right? I'll try. I may not, we may not get, in, get out of first gear here. We'll see. It is interesting to me that from the very beginning, when man needed to speak up, When man needed to do something, we find him silent. We find Adam letting down on the two simple instructions that God had given him. Dress it and keep it. The word dress in the Hebrew there means to work in any sense. By implication, it means to serve, to till. So it's the idea of the gardener working to take care of the garden. It's everything that goes in to the process of gardening, whether that's gardening and growing vegetables or that's gardening and growing flowers and shrubs in your yard. It's, it's the process that goes into that. It is so frustrating to me that everything in my yard that I want to be green and grow and thrive struggles to live. And yet somehow, something that no one put purposefully, I walk past the flower beds into the front door and without fail, it seems like almost every time I walk by, there is a new sprout. You start off at the beginning of the spring and you clean out those flower beds, Brother McGuckin, you put that fresh mulch down and it looks so great. You, you kind of want to just lean back in your, in, your, in your easy chair, get a good old glass of southern sweet tea and just sit back and enjoy your labor. But the problem is you can't stop. Because just give it a couple of days of no attention and no care and something is going to begin to grow there that you don't want there. And so you have got to continually garden. You've got to dress it. You've got to work it. You've got to care for it. And the second thing he told Adam was you need to keep it. The word keep means to hedge about as with thorns. It is to guard. Generally, it is to protect. It is to attend to. I want you to take care of what I've given you. I, I want you to nurture. I want you to, I want you to weed what doesn't belong. I want you to do the best you can to make that healthy and grow. And then I want you to protect what I've given you. I want you to establish a perimeter so that nothing can come in and destroy what you have been given to dress and keep. 
We are in need, I think, like never before, of fathers that are not passive fathers. Oh, hallelujah. I know there's a lot of ladies here today, and I know we've got some men that are not fathers yet or may never be, but bear with me for a few moments this morning. Adam, I, I got two simple things. I, I got two simple. You know, there, there's some people that you can, you can give multiple instructions to at one time, and they're, they're, they got it, and they're going to follow it. And then there's others. You got to go one instruction at a time. You may have a child that you can say, I want you to take the trash out, I want you to unload the dishwasher, I want you to clean your room, and I want you to do whatever, and they got it. And then you got another one, you got to go, all right, <clears throat> I would like for you to take the trash out. Once you have done that, report back to me. We will then go from there. He gave Adam two simple instructions. Dress it, cultivate it, work it, take care of it, and then keep it. And I believe the implication is that not only the garden, but then everything God was going to put in Adam's care, he had the same responsibility for those things. Dress it. And keep it. And it's interesting that when the moment of temptation comes, Bishop said something, I, I think he may have mentioned it in the wedding when we were in, in England in May for uh, Patrick Hemus, brother and sister Hemus, missionaries from this church in Liverpool. When we were there for the wedding, he leaned over to me right before the ceremony. He was supposed to offer some words during the ceremony. He leaned over and he pointed something out that he had never noticed and I had never noticed. Read it, but it never really stood out. And that was God gave the instructions to Adam about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil before Eve was even created. Because the verses we read precede the deep sleep falling upon Adam and Eve being created from his side. Eve was not around when God gave the instructions. You can have everything you want in the garden, but this tree, you cannot eat of it. We, we don't know all the details. We don't know all of the intricacies of the scenario. We just kind of get, I think, kind of a summary of what happened as Eve stands there having looked at this fruit that was appeared to be good for food. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure. There's I don't find anything that demonstrates one way or the other that Adam had previous to this moment told Eve. Perhaps he had. I don't know. I, I don't know one way or the other. The bottom line was God had entrusted Adam with the instructions, and I want you to dress and keep all that I give you. And so now when I give you a wife, I expect you to dress and keep that as well. And so I am instructing you, trusting you to do your job to take care of her. What we do know, according to Scripture, and I, 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 in my study for today, I read that there are those that have varying opinions on exactly what it means, but all I know is when you read the account of Eve and eating from that tree, the Bible says that Adam was with her. 
apparently there's some debate on whether he was with her. I, I'm not sure how you, I'm not sure how you debate that when it says he was with her. I mean, I, I, literally, the King James, do you find those two words? He was with her. I, my, my elementary mind says, if I'm with you, I'm with you. If I'm with you, I'm there. And, and, and so whether or not Adam had told Eve God's instructions, and surely he would have. I mean, something so significant. Surely Adam would have passed the information along to Eve. However, knowing the way some of us men work, he may not have. I, I dread that question. Did, did you know? Sometimes the answer I have, I don't mind that question because there's some things that I'm, I know and I made a conscious choice to not tell. I, I do not. You can believe it if you want to or not. I, I do not tell my wife everything that I deal with as pastor. I do not go home from counseling sessions and tell her every detail of what was discussed. I hear stuff all the time about people that are struggling in their walk with God and their commitment that I do not relay that information to her. And I'm not getting all into the reasons why. If you want to know them, I'll tell you later. And so sometimes I can say, I knew and I purposefully did not tell you. But the other times, did you know? Were you? Um, uh, did you know so-and-so had their baby? Uh, did you know so-and-so was in the hospital? How could you not tell me? I don't know, but at least now you know. (laughs) Can we forget what is behind and press? Let's press toward the mark of better communication in the future. (laughs) I I don't know. I I, I can't judge what Adam did and what he did not do. I, I wasn't there. But what I do know is in a critical moment when he should have been dressing, more importantly, keeping, he stood by and was silent. The pulpit commentary back to these words, it says to dress is to till to cultivate and work it. Even the plants, flowers, and trees of Eden stood in need of cultivation from the hand of man and would, and would speedily have degenerated without his attention. That, that, is, that is an amazing point there to me. Because Eden was, it was paradise. It was, it was as good as you could get. And yet, even those conditions needed someone that was responsible for dressing and keeping them. Even in the the best of circumstances, God tasked Adam with the responsibility of cultivating, of nurturing, and making sure that what was necessary for, for it to flourish was happening, and then guarding it from whatever predators or enemies would try to get in. If that was the case in the garden, in a a place that was as close to perfection as you could get. How much more do we need in 2017 men who are on their game? Men who are guarding not only spouses, but the children that God has invested into their lives to make sure that stuff that is getting in that should not be there is taken out, that weeds that are beginning to grow are removed. I, 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 uh, I, I, 
bear with me this morning. I, again, I'm going to try by the help of the Lord that by the time we're done, if you want it to, it applies to everybody. But I, I got kind of a revelation a couple of months ago. I, I, we have, my wife and I are blessed with four wonderful kids. I am extremely thankful. I, I, I hear people that, you know, as soon as somebody hits 13, they just lose their mind, and it's hell, and it's torment, and, and, and I, I, by the grace of God, that has not been our experience. Challenges, yes. <laughs> and, and, and there is a desire, as I'm sure all parents have, for your, for you, to want your kids to make the right choice, do the right thing, live for God, live according to the Word of God, and to do it and get it all right. But I realized a couple of months ago, Brother Lewis, they have got to make mistakes. That was actually a very wonderful day because I felt a bit of a load lift because my responsibility as a father is not to produce perfection. Sorry, but the heavenly father can't even produce perfection in this. What chance do I have of an imperfect father producing perfection in my offspring? So I realize the idea is not to have the expectation and the pressure of no mistakes. It is to have the hope, at least, that whatever mistakes are made are not as damaging or lasting results as other mistakes. But we've all got to make some mistakes and be reminded that not only have all sinned past tense and come short of the glory of God, but the Scripture also says that a righteous man falls seven times and gets up again. The issue is not that you fall. The issue is not that you make mistakes. The issue is not that you fail. The issue is how do you respond to the mistakes? How do you respond to the failures? Do you give up and quit and decide it's not worth it? Or you, do you do like the prophet Micah said, and, or Micah or Malachi, I think Micah, and you say, you know what? Rejoice not against me, O my enemy, because when I fall, if I'm not mistaken, it doesn't say if. It says when I fall, I shall arise. So while I am not trying to produce perfection in my four kids, I am trying to garden, to cultivate, to see what is there, and to try to remove the weeds from taking over the garden of their lives and then getting the right seed in there. And if there's ever been a day in which we needed fathers to keep to guard, to protect. It's today. I, I don't, I, I still struggle with this. I, I don't understand why as parents, when our kids are toddlers, if you're walking down the sidewalk, there is no hesitation to grab a hand, to pull a child back from the edge of the curb for their protection because they do not understand. They cannot comprehend the danger of the road. Their minds, doesn't, their minds do not understand <laughs> that those cars going by at 20, 30, 50, 60 miles an hour 
can end their life in a split. They, they don't understand that. They don't understand that in a parking lot as a two or three or four year old that you're, you're not seen by the car. I'm sure we're not the only ones that tried to enforce the rule every time we got out of the car with little ones. Everybody has a hand. You get this. When you get that, you just go bear down. You pull all you want to pull. I'm not letting go. And if it hurts, it's because you're resisting. Dad, you're holding too tight. That's because you're pulling too hard. You don't pull, and it's just a gentle grip. You want to pull, we'll show you who's stronger. And so we, we do that without hesitation, without intimidation. And yet somehow they become teenagers and even young adults living in our homes and they now know not to walk out into a street of traffic, or at least they're supposed to know. They now have a bit of an understanding, although according to science, the brain is still developing until age 25, and that's why so many teenagers participate in very dangerous behaviors because according to science, they cannot properly calculate the risk of their According to science, parents, don't ask your teenager, what were you thinking? Because the answer is, they weren't. But somehow they start to face things that really, the consequences are just as significant. And now we feel intimidated to guard and keep. To cultivate. Uh, I wasn't planning to stay on all this this long this morning, but here I am. We feel intimidated that, let me tell you something, teenagers do not understand the dangers of technology. Let me just, Paul, I know this is only a small portion of Antioch Central here today and a smaller portion of Antioch, the Apostolic Church. But let me just tell you parents something right now. If you think that inappropriate stuff taking place on phones is just somewhere out there, you are greatly deceiving yourselves. Why? Because we got bad kids? No, we got kids that are in need of someone to guard and keep. To recognize what is trying to get in that is ultimately going to produce problems, heartache, pain. It's, it amazes me because at least based on what the Scripture says, in one of the greatest moments of need for Adam to speak up, he was absolutely silent. I, I wonder, I wonder, I don't really know if there's a way of proving concretely from Scripture one way or the other, but I wonder, I, I, I kind of think that if Eve had have eaten of that fruit and then handed it to Adam, and Adam would have said, no, God said, we can have everything out there we can eat of every tree in this garden but that tree. I just kind of believe if Adam would have stepped up at that moment and given the proper instructions to Eve and not have partaken the fruit, that the rest of the story would have been a lot different. 
that her mistake could have been overcome if he would have stepped up and done his job to cultivate and to keep. Sometimes, depending on what you're dealing with, there's, there's some things you gotta, you got to very gently deal with. You, you don't just go, if, if, if you got some weeds that are close to some other plants that are more fragile plants, you, you don't go in there with a backhoe to dig out the weeds. Don't even go in there with a shovel and just start digging away. If there's something of value, if there's something worth protecting, you, you get down on your knees and you begin to gently pull, making sure. I say to you fathers today, just because God has established you as the head of your house does not give you the right to just go around and break everything up without care and concern. I, 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 I opened a card this morning. Esther has been in Seattle for several weeks, be there for a couple of more weeks. And she, uh, she, she kind of, Forgive me for a dad moment here. Actually, don't forgive me. I'm going to have a dad moment. I'm going to brag a little bit. So, <laughs> I, I've been very Im impressed. It was kind of a last-minute decision for her to go. And she, uh, she took time to make cards for everybody in the family. And then not just cards. <laughs> I have now been on two treasure hunts. with maps that were drawn out. The first one was about two weeks ago, a week and a half ago, I guess, and it was my office, and I followed the map, and I found in my office a succulent. I'm not sure there's any such thing as a 45-year-old hipster, but apparently that's what my daughter's trying to make me. <laughs> and so there was... There was there was a note yesterday with a map for today at which I followed the map yesterday and I found in the bottom of the nightstand a Father's Day card and a Father's Day gift. And she made a statement in there that, has some, that is something that I have striven for that I honestly, Brother Isaac, really do not feel like I have achieved. And the statement was, you have been, I, this is not exact quote, but the gist of the statement was, you have been a great example of the Heavenly Father to me. I, I, got, I honestly, I, I don't feel like I have achieved, that's been my goal, but I don't feel like I have achieved that. But I was very thankful to hear that because that is my desire. I, I, I want my response to be like the responses my good, good father has. You ever get one of those moments when you were a kid and you, you, you disobeyed? And you knew, your parents knew, and you were just waiting for them to finally say something. I know you know. I know you. I know you know. Would you please just say something? I don't know about you, but there have been some times... I know you know. Would you please <laughs> say something? And what I am expecting you to say is going to be rather loud and rather mean. And in those moments, rather than getting the backhoe out and digging everything up, he just comes along 
and gently begins to pull some things out. So let me see if I can find the runway this morning. I'll leave you fathers alone for now. There's nothing that I know of that God asks of us that He has not first done Himself or is willing to do. In fact, I think the Scripture makes that point clear. It says that He was in all points, all points, tempted like we were. There are some that have a theological uh, belief that Jesus could not sin. That it was impossible for him to have sinned. If that's the case, he could not have accomplished what he came to accomplish. He had to have the same ability you and I have to sin, to make the decisions, and yet live a life where he chose not to sin. Otherwise, it it wouldn't have worked. And so it says that in all points he was tempted as we were. It says, really, the, 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 the summary of the first 30 years of his life is basically that he learned obedience by the things he suffered. That tells me that he wasn't, he wasn't some special child. It seems to me, and some of you have been blessed to have a different experience than this. Really, you have, but a lot of us, it's not the greatest blessing when that first child comes along and they are like, perfect. You take them home, the first night you put them down on the bed, they go to sleep, don't wake up until the next morning. Never cry, don't fuss, whimper a little bit, you respond and they're all better and you're like, you know what, this is pretty great. Let's do it again. Let's have some more. I mean, if they're all this good and this easy, let's just have some more. And then, the next one comes along. Now, wait a minute. It wasn't this. This isn't quite like the first one. But you know what? Maybe if we go one for one more, that one will be like the first one. Oh, boy. He's downstairs, and gossiping is a sin. (laughs) Oh, my word. Woo! I got to tell you, I I don't know. I had these preconceived ideas that females going through their teenage years was going to be like such a horrible challenge. And I was all prepared for that, and it's kind of been a smooth ride. I figured, you know what, man, we get the boys to team, we'll be smooth sailing. I mean, the girls are the ones that are moody, right? <laughs> Sorry, I'll be real careful and minimize this because one of them's got to get up on the keyboard in a moment, so. So you you realize, you know what, it everyone's different, everyone's unique, and and you gotta you gotta learn them. First three, our first three were pacifier addicts. I mean, I don't five or six years old we were trying to get Elizabeth to give hers up and Sorry, that, that's paybacks for yesterday. Those of you that weren't at the leadership meeting as my dad was talking about my birth and that my forehead started at my eyebrows and went back to the back of my head. So I'm just, just a little poetic justice this morning. 
<laughs> I don't know how I got into all that. Let me see if I can get back to the point here and find a way to land this plane. Back where I was before all those tangents, he never asks of me what he doesn't. Oh, I know where I was. So even Jesus apparently was not like this automaton toddler child. He had to learn. So he understands. In fact, the Bible says he remembers that our frame, our frame that we are just dust. Hebrew says we have a high priest. I'm going to rephrase it in the positive. It uses double negatives, but what it says is that we have a high priest who is touched by the feelings of our infirmities. And so everything we've been through, he understands. And again, he does not ask of us what he has not done or that he would not be willing to do. So when he says to Adam, I'm giving you this responsibility and I want you to dress it and keep it. I want you to work it, cultivate it, nurture it to produce, and then I want you to protect what has been produced. That must be a, 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 an instruction that comes from what our Heavenly Father does for us. I was standing there this morning as that song was being sung, sensing and feeling the same thing that my wife stepped up to say. And I know in a, in, a, in a moment, as I said, we're going to pray for our fathers or I'm going to give that opportunity. Father's Day is about honoring. But I also think Father's Day is, is a great day for us to be reminded and perhaps experience in a new way the Heavenly Father. You see, the good thing about the Heavenly Father is he's, he's not like us as humans. I'm not sure. I don't know. I, I, I got a little bit of an idea of it. I read a little bit, tried to educate myself a little bit. I, I understand a little bit why in some of those moments of greatest need that men are silent. One of the common reasons is because there is a fear. There's a fear that I, I don't know what to say. Or there's a fear that I may say the wrong thing. And so, as much damage as it may do, it's all seems like it's easier to withdraw into a shell of silence because I don't want to fail. Because if I fail, then that causes me to question my manhood. But there's a Heavenly Father who knows exactly what to say. And when to say it. And if I will listen, He will speak it into my life. And so my encouragement today, whether our kids and teens mostly are gone, so to the adults that sit in this room, whether young adults or middle-aged, or our better folks. You have a gardener and a garden and a guardian who stands by willing and ready if 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 
you will let him. He doesn't force his way in. He doesn't barge into your world. God is the perfect gentleman. Revelation says it like this. The Lord said through John, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open, I'll come in. I'll sup with my fellowship with him. I, this is another one of those things that you can imagine it the way you want to imagine it, and I'll imagine it the way I imagine it. And I imagine it this way. That that knock is a very gentle knock. That it's not a beating on the door. It is not a banging with full force. But it is an extremely gentle knock. So gentle that if you don't stop. You ever have one of those times with those little ones that you, you thought you heard them on, at the door? Is somebody at the door? I think that's the way he stands and knocks. And I think he stands here today as the ready and willing gardener and guardian of your life. If you will just give him full access. Some of you have had the unfortunate experience of being raised without a father who was there to dress and keep. Some of you were raised that the father was in the house. i I'm, I'm thought a lot the last couple of years, I'm not really sure what's worse. A home where the father is physically absent and not there. Or a home where the Father is physically present, but emotionally, socially, is absent. Both of them have very negative effects. Jesus said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts, if you, with your human nature, your sinful nature, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does your heavenly Father, who is perfect in all of His ways, not only know what you need, not only have the ability to give it, but stands ready and willing to do so. I want you to stand, if you would, please. I want to. I want to close out today this way. I again in the past when we typically pray for fathers or mothers on Mother's Day, we just ask you to raise your hand where you are, and we pray for you. But I felt to do it different this morning in light of this message. With regards to the first part of this message today, I want to give an invitation, first to fathers, but secondly to men, to future fathers, to make a fresh new commitment. Because the same command God gave Adam in the garden is still for you and I today that we have a responsibility of dressing and keeping what God has entrusted to us. So I'm going to ask the fathers that are willing to make a fresh commitment to that. I don't care if all your kids are adult kids. I've been paying attention. I've actually talked to a few, and I'm starting to realize. I'm not starting. I've been realizing for a long time now, them getting out of the house doesn't mean you're done. And that if you are a good father and a good mother, you don't just wipe your hands of them because they leave your house. Your role changes, your responsibilities change. I understand all of that changes, but you don't just cease being a mother or a father. 
So I don't care if you've got adult grown children today. Maybe, maybe you've, you're a grandparent today. But you're willing this morning to make a fresh commitment. God, by your grace, by your help, I'm going to dress and keep. I'm going to nurture and cultivate. I'm going to garden what you've given me to take care of. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to protect it. I'm going to be un- aware of the enemy that's trying to come in to my children, to my spouse, that's trying to destroy. And I'm going to do my best to protect. If you're willing to make that fresh commitment today, I'm going to ask you to come and stand to my right. Give me just a moment. Thank you for your desire, but let me finish this part. Because I also want to give an invitation, and you may need to come stand in the middle, some of you. (laughs) Because I want to give an invitation to some today that would come down to this altar, and your response today is, God, Father, I welcome you into my life to be the keeper, the dresser of my life. I welcome you into my life to look into my world and see the weeds and the things that are trying to overtake the good stuff and to pull them out. And I welcome you into my life to guard me and to protect me. And so, I'm really not trying to be facetious with this, but if you're a, if you're a man and both of those apply to you, you can just come down to the middle. But if you're here and you're willing to respond to the second part, I ask you to come stand down here as well. I don't guess we necessarily have to divide it up. Just you can come for whichever one of those. But this isn't just for the men today. I believe there's some precious ladies here today that you need Him as your heavenly Father to do for you what an earthly father has failed to do. But that He is anxiously willing, ready to do. Would you bow your heads as those that want to come begin to come just to offer a little more privacy if you will. But if you're willing brethren, again, I'm not just appealing to fathers because every male I think in some form or fashion has the same responsibility in their world to dress and to keep what God has entrusted to them. So I invite you, but if you're here today and you acknowledge, you know what, God, I I need you as my father. I've got some stuff in my life that I know needs to be weeded, it needs to be taken out. And I know there's probably some some good stuff, there's some fertilizer, there's some nutrients that I need put into my life to help those good things produce. Then I'm opening my heart and my life to you. In the name of Jesus, would you begin to pray? There's If some of you would like to come join some of these down here, if you're a spouse for one of these men today and you'd like to come, or if you're a, I know most of the young people are gone, if one of these men down here is your father and you'd like to come and just stand with them and pray for them right now, I invite you to do that. Come on, the presence of the Lord has been in this place all morning. There's some deep things that I believe have already happened here today, but again, He's not done today. I challenge every father in this place today. Your future. Your future as a father does not have to simply be a repeat of your past. If you've made some mistakes... If you know you haven't quite done it the way you should have done it, if you if you know you haven't quite been what you should have been, it's not too late to make a fresh start today. Jesus, I want you as the gardener and the guardian of my life. And in turn, God, to, to those that you have entrusted into my care, I want to be faithful. I want to be faithful to the responsibility you have entrusted me with. God, 
I pray that you would help me learn from from Adam's mistake, Adam's silence, and in those moments, God, where that guarding and that keeping is needed, that you would give the strength and the grace to step in. I see a few of you doing it, but especially to you men that are down here, you don't have to, but if you would, maybe there's another brother close by that you would just lay a hand on their shoulder. We could just kind of join together right now, pray one for another a little bit. God, I pray for grace and strength today, every man in this church, God, to fulfill the responsibility you have given us, Lord. To fulfill the commands that you have given us, God. To dress and to keep what you have entrusted us with. I pray for every individual right now, God, that is in need of you in their life, God. To be that for them. God, those that have lived with the void of a natural father for whatever reasons did not fulfill that role, that responsibility of dressing and keeping that you, God, would do that in the lives that are in this place today. In the name of Jesus, I pray for strength today, God. I pray for grace today. I pray for courage, God, in the midst of a world where there are all kinds of things trying to come in and destroy the lives of those you have entrusted us with. Give us the courage to stand and guard and keep. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, for every man here today, every father, that their experience with their father may not have been the greatest. It may not have been a good example. It may not have been a good experience. That you would help, that you would help them today to accept you as the heavenly father. In the name of Jesus. I want to be more like you, Jesus. I want to be more like you, Jesus. I want to be more like you, Jesus. I don't want to be more like the frame of reference that I have in this world. I don't want to be more like what we are used to in the world around us. I want to be more like you, Jesus. I want to be more like you, Jesus. I want to follow your example. I want to follow in your footsteps. I want to be more like you. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. I want to be more like you. I want to be more like you. I want to be more like you, Lord. Come on, why don't you let him do a little gardening in you right now? Why don't you let him do a little bit of gardening in you today? Maybe, maybe there's a little bit of weeding that needs to be done in your life this morning. Maybe there's some stuff that needs to be dug out a little bit today. I, I know that's not comfortable. I know that's not easy, but... Maybe there's some things he wants to pull out of your life today so that the good things that are supposed to be there can flourish and thrive in your life. I want to be more. I want to be more like you. I want to be more. I want to be more like you, Jesus. Every day I want to be more like you. Every day I want to be more like you. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Help me to be more like you. Help me to be more like you, Lord. 
the name of Jesus. Whenever you need to go or want to go, you're welcome to do so. Thank you for being here today. be more like